For nine years, they were considered as amongst the worst apples in the barrel. Four soldiers, paid and trained to uphold law and order, had turned to terrorism, or so it was thought. Now, after a string of court cases, three of them are free and fighting a new battle. They are determined that they, along with the friend they had to leave in jail, are proven innocent after being proven guilty. Tonight on Counterpoint, we open a new file on Neil Latimer and what is now the UDR-3. The killing of Adrian Carroll in Armagh shook many foundations. The jailing for life of four soldiers in the Ulster Defence Regiment for the murder yet again chipped away at nationalist beliefs in the impartiality of the regiment. And nine years later, their convictions have shaken the beliefs of many loyalists in the police and legal system. It was a Tuesday afternoon in the winter of 1983 when Adrian Carroll, a young Catholic, headed home from work in Armagh City. He was being followed by a gunman who waited until he turned into an entry, then shot him dead. Retracing the steps of that gunman led to the conviction of the UDR-4 and began a legal fight which has led to three of them getting out of jail. The case is a complex one. To this day, the RUC maintains that the chain of events began when four members of a UDR patrol set up a bogus checkpoint at this school. It's alleged that Neil Latimer, the only one of the four still behind bars, got out of his UDR uniform, changed into civilian clothes, which he had hidden under mobile classrooms, and set off to murder Adrian Carroll. The killer quickened his pace at the main post office in the city and then moved in for the kill. It's claimed that after the shooting, Neil Latimer ran down this street and was bundled into the back of a waiting UDR Land Rover for the getaway. Within hours, the Loyalist terror group, the Protestant Action Force, said they killed Adrian Carroll. Within a few weeks, the UDR-4 were being held for the murder. From the age of 16, James Hagen wanted to be a professional soldier. Later in life, his ability with guns won him many accolades. He is adamant, however, that on the day Adrian Carroll died, he did not fire a gun, nor know who did. On the 8th of November 1983, uh, I reported uh, for duty along with uh, uh, other members of the uh, platoon. Uh, our duty time was uh, 1,300 hours to 2,100 hours that night, uh, which was 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And uh, none of us knew what uh, our original duty was when we reported that day. And in actual fact, uh, the duty had been changed because uh, an RUC patrol spotted uh, two suspect terrorists coming across fields the evening before off the Moy Road. So, uh, at the request of the RUC, uh, uh, this area was uh, requested to be searched and the company was informed that morning at uh, t no later than 10 o'clock. So, uh, in actual fact, we didn't find out what our duty was until uh, we were sitting in court uh, two, two years later. And this is the day that the uh, trial judge and his judgment uh, found the and said that this is the day we packed the shooting in Carroll. Noel Bell, a former mechanic, was a member of the same patrol. We were leaving the My Road to go into the police station to have our tea break. It was just beginning to get dark at that, uh, that period. And we arrived at the police station, the back door, the entry that we used into the police station. And we we'd basically only got through the door and the panic started about a guy being murdered are being shot. We didn't know he'd been murdered at that stage. Winston Allen, now in the process of taking an open university degree, had been with this unit for just five days. I remember going out with a patrol and I was with uh, two Land Rovers which Jim Hagen was in charge and I was with Noel Bell in the Land Rover and we went out to do a search on the Moy Road and once we had the search finished, we come back into town and we went to the police station for a break. And it was just at that time that um, we were called out again on an emergency call. We didn't know what had actually happened at that time, but we were sent out to do a search on the Portadown Road. And we stayed there for about an hour and we were brought back in again. Now, 
it was some time later that I heard that it was Adrian Carroll had been shot. And then there was Neil Latimer, another man with a passion for cars, who, according to the police, was the actual gunman who killed Adrian Carroll. His mother strongly disagrees. The day Adrian Carroll was shot, Neil went to pull down the bass suit. He was going to Barbara's sister's wedding. He came home at shortly after half past twelve. Maybe before, I don't, I just can't remember. He wanted to stay at home, but he said he was going to be late. By the time he got ready, he had to be on duty for one o'clock. And he wanted to stay at home, and I forced him to go to his work. A thing which I regret now. He, he went out to his work. He said he'd be home at seven o'clock. He didn't arrive home to nine. And when he came home, he asked me who was shot. Once arrested, the four, along with three other members of the regiment, were questioned at the RUC's main holding centre, Castle Ray. Latimer, Bell, Hagen and Allen confessed to their roles in the murder, and today they explain why. Well, when the statement was manufactured that night, uh, I was just at the main the teller. Uh, I could not see any other way out than uh, this making this statement because of the threats that had been made uh, towards uh, myself and my family, what was going to happen to them. Uh, there was also uh, threats made against my brother-in-law that he as well was going to be arrested and taken into Castle Ray. So the whole object of, uh, from the detectives in Castle Ray is to actually break you know, a person to the point where they can see no other way out than to uh, make a statement. And th th what, ha what also happens in Castle Ray is they take your memory of the day away, which uh, is a form, some might think that brainwashing is too strong a word, but that is actually what happened, it was my memory of the day was taken away. The first interview now wasn't, wasn't really too bad, but from the second interview on it was got really, really bad. It was a very, very bad atmosphere. And the, the first interview, there were more or less questions about my movements on the 8th of November, but from the second interview on it was verbally and physically ab abused. And this was more or less on and off all day, whenever the interviewing officers changed round. Now, the, it was an interview that night at about 10 o'clock. was whenever I was abused the worst. You know, I got a pretty bad beating by the police. And it was that. It was a combination of the, the psychological torture all day and then finally that, that last bit of physical abuse sort of put me over the, over the edge, so to speak. What um, sort of things did they do? Well, I was punched round the, the chest, I was slapped in the face and punched three, three times in the testicles. I was knocked to the floor and winded and stuff like that there and constantly uh, shared it at and shared it down and called a lion cunt and, and that sort of thing, you know. When you say there was psychological torture, what was that? The psychological torture was, you didn't really know what was happening at the time, but looking back on it, you knew exactly what they were at. They were constantly belittling you and trying to make you look a fool in their eyes, and they were playing wee games with you, psychological games. There was one instance where they'd, they'd, one of the interviewers would offer you a sweet, and another one would say, if you take that there, I'll break your neck, sort of thing, and it just left you, you didn't know what was happening. Or, or what they were actually doing to you. I was tired. Uh, I was worn down over a number of days. And the police had told me what I would term as lies in Castlereagh. And over a period, you begin to weaken. And you're physically tired. And you just, I couldn't stand up to that type of interrogation. The confessions helped secure the conviction of the UDR4. But the evidence of a woman who knew Neil Latimer put them behind bars, and is the main reason why Latimer remains there. The woman revealed only to the trial as witness A was in Armagh on the afternoon of the murder. She's adamant she saw Neil Latimer in civilian clothes being bundled into a Land Rover by two UDR men in what looked like an arrest. She first gave her testimony to a local priest and then to the police. But the UDR4 are adamant that she's mistaken. 
Throughout their 68-day trial in 1986, Latimer, Hagen, Bell and Allen said they had no knowledge of the murder of Adrian Carroll and said their interrogators in Castle Ray had forced them to sign false confessions. Mr. Justice Basil Kelly rejected their claims. The former soldiers were guilty of murder. Behind bars, the UDR-4 never accepted their imprisonment. While Noel Bell indulged his passion for cars in paint and Neil Latimer made gifts for his family, they met regularly to discuss the trial, their appeal and getting out. In 1988, the appeal court did look at the case again. The outcome remained the same, guilty as charged. Two years later, a major step forward for the four. The authorities ordered that notes taken by detectives who questioned them at Castle Ray should be sent for electronic analysis or ESDA testing. The tests showed that changes had been made to the alleged statements of confession. From inside the jail, the UDR-4 watched as the British legal system seemed to tear itself apart. Freedom came for the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, all victims of a miscarriage of justice. It was during this period that Robert Key, the broadcaster and author who had helped prove those miscarriages, became interested in the UDR-4. I first got involved uh, by a letter from Jim Hagen from prison, saying this was before their first appeal. Uh, saying that uh, a grave miscarriage of justice had taken place in their case. And I wrote back, as you have to when you get a letter like that, saying, um, thank you for your letter, I'm prepared to leave you. I'm also prepared to believe that you're guilty. I'll look into it. I think that's always the first stage. You have to look at the thing purely objectively and as dispassionately as you can. But then, of course, once you begin to think there's something wrong with this case, you begin to want to know more, you begin to want to see the people involved. I then visited them in prison. I saw them each at least twice with their families. I realized they'd been seeing their families like that for, uh, I'm, I'm talking about 1989, I think, um, at least seven years, six years. Uh, and that if they'd been lying every week to their families like that, they would seem to me very different sort of people to the sort of people they seem to be. Armed now with a dossier of inconsistencies in the case, campaigners headed for court again with a new air of confidence. It was to be short-lived. There were cries from the public gallery, shouts of, no, shame, he's innocent. Latimer held his head in his hands. He then said, let me out of here and got out of the dock. He shouted, you don't know what justice is. A policeman and a prison officer restrained Latimer. As he struggled, other prison officers grappled with him. He was taken from the court as relatives and supporters continued to shout. The decision today by the appeal court to hold Neil Latimer and to sustain, or to sustain his conviction is a complete and total gigantic error. Until now, Neil Latimer's behaviour in court was put down to an emotional outburst from a man who thought he was about to be set free. His mother refutes this. Neil was going to commit suicide at the, at the court. He was going to put his fists through the window and leave his blood in the courtroom. Mr Bell went in and spoke to him and told him that the fight would still go on. He calmed down, but when I was talking to him for a few minutes, he was very, very annoyed and very, very angry. Since that unsuccessful appeal, Latimer has been receiving regular prison visits from the campaign team who remain determined to secure his release. I have to say his morale is terrific. He's just very, very determined. And he said, actually, that he's not going to get out of this place, and he won't get out of it, and he won't accept parole or any premature release until his innocence is established. The other three, of course, have been to visit him there, and that helped him, helped his morale very much, And because they're very strong to get at the truth, too. And they're not discontent with having been um, released. They, they want to help him very much. And uh, actually, I hope to go and see them later today. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Hello.
But I think it'll, it'll have to focus on the heavens of what say. Because that is basically what's holding Neil in prison at this moment. Yeah. I don't think we'll, the three of us or the four of us will be able to put the whole experience behind us till Neil has been released and uh, the truth of the case established. It's something we're going to have to fight on to clear our own names and to clear Neil Adamer's name and get him out. And the case certainly isn't over as far as we're concerned. Well, really, I wouldn't feel fully innocent until Neil has been released. Uh, it certainly leaves in the public mind a doubt about my innocence. And until Neil uh, could be released, uh, it leaves me, in a way, still guilty, technically guilty. Well, good luck with it. And good luck with it. Thanks very much. It's been very nice to see you again. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye now. Pressure is being maintained, too, by the team which brought freedom to what were once convicted killers. Three years ago, we were told that we would never get any of the men out. Um, we've been fairly successful in a very short period of time. Uh, hopefully, um, we can build, we can work upon the momentum that has been created by the case. We can look at the rewrites of Neil Latimer. We can highlight those rewritten material once again. And maybe by this time next year, we could be back in the court room situation, but it will take time. Neil knows that. The families know that. But that does not uh, dilute our enthusiasm. We are determined to see this case through and to have a victory. We say that uh, there will be a new body of evidence that will be submitted shortly to the Secretary of State and within the context of the 1980 criminal appeals legislation, we are hopeful that the case will be referred back to the Court of Appeal for a third time. I cannot possibly believe that any jury hearing all the evidence that is now available and which was available to the Court of Appeal would possibly, under any circumstances, convict any of these people and certainly would not convict Latimer. While the thoughts of the UDR3 are now directed at the man they left behind, there's also now time to take stock of the legal catastrophe which took nine years off their lives. My view of the judicial system, uh, especially in the, uh, the Diplock courts, uh, after our trial, which lasted uh, 68 days, is just a force. Because we listened to the evidence uh, and cross-examination of all the RUC detectives in the case. And uh, most of them were in the witness box for uh, a day and some for a day and a half. And it was obvious that these men were telling lie after lie as to what took place in Castlereagh. But yet, no, the trial judge, Lord Justice Kelly, he turned around and accepted their evidence. And I believe that uh, if it had been a jury trial, there's no way would any jury have accepted the evidence of these RUC detectives. Primarily, I blame the, the RUC, a certain element within the RUC that framed us and put us down for this murder. To some extent, I, I blame the UDR, and in others, I blame the court system and, uh, and the police as well. It's, to me, they all take some responsibility for me being in jail. On his release, either through completing his sentence or another successful appeal, Neil Latimer will have the support of the young woman who has been his girlfriend since she was 13. She bought her own engagement ring after his unsuccessful appeal. Before the appeal, we were decided that we would get married once he got out, but it turned out that he didn't get his appeal, so I went down the following week and I just decided we would get engaged that, there and then. <laughs> In the meantime, those campaigning for Latimer's release continue the fight to clear his name and to introduce the reforms which they believe would help ensure that it could not happen again. Any legal system needs to be able to, to look at its methods to, to be able to reform itself and really we have a royal commission that is examining the criminal justice system in England and Wales in the post Tottenham 3, Guildford 4, Birmingham 6 atmosphere. A, any person concerned with human rights, with miscarriages, with the criminal justice system in Northern Ireland would like to see the immediate extension of that royal commission to look at the Northern Ireland system. I think probably the most controversial one would be to introduce audio and visual recordings in police interview rooms. I think that would, first of all, help the police officer uh, from being wrongly criticised about his conduct. But secondly, it would protect the suspect from being treated in an, an oppressive way. 
and it gives the, the, the block court system, gives the judge, the trial judge, the opportunity to look at un incontrovertible evidence which proves how the police operated. And I think that would be a, a great guarantee for both the suspects and the police officers involved. I would like to see a court which, given the uh, possibility or having accepted the possibility that there might be a miscarriage of justice, looks at the whole thing all over again, puts out of their mind whether these people are guilty or innocent, and um, s starts searching purely for the truth. Now reunited with his family, James Hagen also believes in those reforms. But he and his freed colleagues are still coming to terms with the system which they fought to uphold and then fought to condemn. Well, for years I have, you know, like most other people have heard, uh, people from the nationalist community speaking about Castle Ray, and, uh, well, I wouldn't have believed, you know, what they were saying about Castle Ray. But it's not until one goes there, uh, that is when one finds out uh, that most of the things that have been said about Castle Ray over the years by nationalists is true. I was brought up with uh, actually members uh, on the periphery of my family who were members of the RUC. And we were always brought up to respect law and order and do what a police tell you to do, that type of thing. And I never ever would have believed that they were capable of what put us through. Well, if justice is done in relation to those uh, RUC detectives, uh, who rewrote the interview notes and fabricated uh, the interview notes and a own written statement in our case. If just as done, these men should be charged and convicted. The UDR-4 never expected to become the UDR-3. But in spite of the bitter taste of a judgment which left Neil Latimer behind bars, there's still sweetness in freedom itself. I had to go out for a walk straight away and just went down to town in Market Hill and the funny enough, the, the first people I met were the police. And after that day, I got a wee bit suspicious that there was a person walking the streets at half two in the morning. And they came over and stopped the car and, and started to question me. But then they realised, I think, who I was, and, and said, I suppose you're the last person we want there. I suppose you, I, <laughs> you want to see. After nine years, you know, it's fantastic to be out. And just the fact of being free and trying to adjust to a normal way of life, that, that, that's enough for the moment.